to, to our patient. By that, we can just add a hydrogen ion. But in our blood gas, we don't really measure hydrogen ion additions, we, we measure bicarb. And so the more hydrogen ions that we give somebody, what does that do to our bicarb? It drops it, right? Mm -hmm. So when we add hydrogen ions to this mix, really what we're doing is in our measurement of our gas, we're dropping our bicarb. So there's a few ways that we can add acid to our patients, for example. Um, we can become, give, give me some metabolic reasons that you see at bedside when we are adding acid to our patient. 2,3 DPG. <laughs> <laughs> you missed that part. That's good. Yeah, you missed that part. How do we add acid to our patient? Critical. Sorry? Drop Sorry? Drop okay, but that's not, that's not hydrogen ions, that's CO2. That's a little bit different, okay? CO2 is an acid, but it's not a hydrogen ion acid. Sorry? Yeah, so lactic acid is a big one, right? So our, our patients that, for example, uh, are underperfused, um, we have a few metabolic conditions where we can get lactic acidosis. Um, what if um, a patient really has bad diarrhea? What happens? <laughs> They're losing bicarb, right? So um, we have diarrhea, for example, because we have um, bicarb losses. Conversely, we can take acid out of our system as well, and that we can become alkalotic. <coughs> and when we take acid out of our system, right, so we're going to be decreasing acid, in fact, what but what we see biochemically is usually an increase in bicarb. So how do we take acid out of our system? Vomiting. Sorry? Vomiting. Vomiting, Vomiting is a big one, right? Vomiting is probably the biggest one. Okay, so those are two examples. And of course, we have toxic overdoses. We have wide anion gap metabolic acidosis, and we might talk about those. So if we add acid to a system, we're going to become acidotic. If we take acid out or add bicarb, we're going to become alkalotic. So that's kind of the first one. When we talk about respiratory, now we're talking about CO2. Now CO2 is also an acid. Um, we have different acids in our body. Hydrogen ion is what we classically think, but CO2 is considered an acid. It's a respiratory acid. So if we want to make our patient acidotic, all we have to do is we have to increase our CO2 because it's an acid. If we want to make our patient alkalotic, we just have to drop our CO2. So these are different acids than the hydrogen acid, but if we think about this one compartment syndrome, it basically has the same effect. Now what do you think works quicker? Does, do you think it works quicker to blow off CO2 or to hold your breath and accumulate CO2 or have these hydrogen acid changes? Okay, this is very quick. So when we talk about compensation, um, typically compensation is, is done at both levels, but this is the quick way of doing it. If we, let's say, have a ton of diarrhea, 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 we're becoming acidotic, 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 what is the body going to do? It, there's one acid that it can get rid of very quickly. We can blow CO2 off. We can do that instantly. So this is very quick because this is done at the level of the lungs. It's actually done at the brain stem that basically gets this bathing of acidosis and adjusts our breathing rate. So this is very, very quick. I can get all of you to pass out if you hyperventilate very, very quickly. Now this is done at the levels of the kidneys, this compensation. And because it's done at the level of the kidneys, it's not absolutely immediate like the level of the lungs. This normally takes some time to kick in. So for example, if I have raised ICP and I'm adjusting my CO2 on its own, it's going to take a number of hours for my kidneys to, um, to basically adjust so that I can get into this nice electrochemical neutral zone here. So your kidneys are slow, your kidneys deal with your hydrogen bicarb, your lungs are very quick and they deal with the CO2. Two different acids, however, they have a tremendous or a, a, an effect obviously on the overall pH of, of your body. So think about it as one compartment, adding acids, taking acids out, okay? Does that help at all? I know for your RTs this is all a, a simple review. Um, yeah, and so when it comes to the compensation about what Todd was saying, 
He is right in a certain extent, but all of that data was based on healthy adult data, the compensation. So as far as kids are concerned, I would never look at a gas and I would say, oh, this is partially compensated based on this correction factor. There's a nice, it, it's a nice little wiggle equation, but it, the, if you look at the data, it comes back to data that's old and based on adults. You can do a history and a physical and figure out what is exactly going on in your patient. So if you have a patient that has really bad gastro for four weeks and is, you know, you know, diarrhea, diarrhea losses, and you get a gas, you should be able to correspond the gas with the patient. So history, physical, your gas is not a diagnostic. Your gas is helping you build a story that you already should have a really good idea about. So that's how I, I approach it. Rather than looking at these little compensation things, you should be able, based on history and physical, to know what's going on with your patient and your gas and should corroborate what you're suspecting. Okay? All right. It makes a kid's anatomy unique. And then very important for you out in the field is what are you going to think about intubating and um, how are we going to assess the airway because when we intubate, we don't want surprises. We can predict a lot of the, the things and the, and the difficulties along the way. And sometimes we do get surprised, but most of the surprises can be mitigated if we spent time earlier looking at things correctly. So um, one of my mentors was an anesthetist, and so some of these slides I've taken from him. Um, important to know how the pediatric anatomy is different than adult anatomy because oftentimes we get adult learners or when you go to a hospital there's going to be a, a doctor or a nurse there that's very comfortable. The adults are going to look at you and raise their spocking eyebrow and think why are you doing it that way. So we do things a little bit differently primarily because the anatomy and the physiology is a little bit different. Know why we have to intubate? We talked a little bit about that earlier. And very, very important and the most important thing in all of these is we want to recognize a difficult airway. Um, and a difficult airway is very important to recognize because maybe we're not going to intubate if it's a really, really difficult airway. Okay? And these are based on the competencies of our CAP C. So when we talk about um, pediatric airway anatomy, kids are quite a bit different than adults. Um, the nose is responsible for a lot of airway resistance. And in an infant, um, as we know, we call infants obligate nasal breathers, which is kind of untrue. Because there was a study that was done, I don't know how they got ethics approval, where there was a physician that walked around in an ICU and plugged babies' noses to see if some could breathe or not with their mouths. And he found, in fact, that about 15% were able to breathe through their mouths, but we, it's, it's perpetuated in the literature that infants are obligate nasal breathers, and they kind of are. And we know that just a little bit of snot can cause big problems with them, right? We know that the tongue is relatively big in comparison with their mouths. We know that... Um, for example, with Down syndrome kids, we call them, we say that they have relative macroglossia, so their tongue is much bigger than their mouths. Kids are not to that same extent, but their tongue is bigger than their mouth ought to be. And it's probably related to the fact that um, they need a large tongue in order to breastfeed. Um, we also know that the tongue can cause tr troubles um, in kids, primarily with sedation, um, sometimes when they're sleeping, um, and more importantly, when there's something going on with their brain. And the tongue can be a cause of upper airway obstruction. So the tongue cannot be your friend in some, some instances. So when we look at the larynx, um, really quite interesting is the larynx kind of migrates down the neck as we get a little bit older. And that has to do with the fact that if you look at a, at a neonatal patient that looks like a tadpole, they got this ginormous head, the short neck, and they kind of taper in. As, as, as we kind of grow into um, our adult bodies, the head gets relatively smaller, the neck gets longer and narrower. And as the neck grows and the head gets relatively smaller, you get a migration of the larynx. And so that is important because in an infant, the reason why the neonatal patients are so difficult to intubate is right when you turn the corner, that's where it is. And it's very difficult to hide under where an adult, you turn the corner and you go down a few feet and you go down a little bit further and then you finally find it. In the neonatal patient, you go around the tongue and bam, right there is your airway. And that makes it sometimes difficult. Interesting too is where's the narrowest part? In the adults, the narrowest part is at the level of the vocal cords. When we're talking about a child, the, the narrowest part is the cricoid cartilage. And so why is that important? Well, that's where tube selection is very important. 
if you have an adult, for example, and you're able to pass the tube through the vocal cords, you know the rest is going to be easy. Where in a kid, tube selection is very important because when you pass the vocal cords, you still haven't met the narrowing. And that's why we have certain formulas in order to determine what tube is appropriate at what age. So this is what I talk about, um, particularly with the needle, neonatal patient, and things get a little bit easier as, as the patient ages. This is um, a, a view. Imagine that um, this, this drawing is somebody's head like this, and it's cut from behind, and so we're looking from the top and from the back. And so Valhalla for intubating is your epiglottis. If you can find the epiglottis, you are absolute gold. Because the epiglottis is your landmark that the cords are just below. This is what you're trying to find. Now, when you are intubating a neonate, as I said, you have the tongue and basically the epiglottis is right here and you have to make that corner. It's also moved more to the front. And so not only do you have to make an acute corner, you almost have to come back. Where the adults, it's dropped and it's also posterior so that when you make the corner, it's right in line. Hence, neonatal, if you can intubate a neonatal patient, you can intubate almost anything, except for a cat. The cat is apparently even tougher. Um, I think more anterior and shorter as well. So I tried to get you reps with vets, but they didn't want to do it. I'm like, it's a freaking cat, but they, they wouldn't buy it. So epiglottis. This is your epiglottis. So again, we'll go back to this anatomy here. Your epiglottis is your landmark because it's sticking out. It's this big sail. If you can find your epiglottis, you know that your cords are below that. In the neonatal patient, in the young patient, your epiglottis is an omega, a shaped, flappy thing. And that's likely the most difficult thing um, in, in intubating is once you turn that corner, you have to pick this up. And it's floppy, and oftentimes you'll get the straight or the miller there, and it's flopping from one side to another. So it's floppy, it's omega, and it's very, very big in kids. As the adults, as, as, as we get um, older, this gets stiffer, it starts to flatten out, and it gets deeper. The other thing as I was talking about is, is how it's angled. As you notice, um, it, it's the, the angle is quite a bit different here. And this is the angle of the epiglottis with the, with, the, with the airway. Again, the angling doesn't help us. So it's higher, it's angled, and it's anterior. When we talk about the head, again, our neonatal patients are tadpoles, right? They got massive heads. As we get older, smaller, smaller heads is that our head can, can be our friend, but it can also be a problem in, in, the, in the young if we don't deal with it correctly. The most important thing is, is that when we are intubating a kid, what we want to do is we want to line up the airways or, or the axes as well as possible. I think I got another slide. What we want to do is we want to bring the tragus of the ear to the sternum, and I got a few slides with that. When you have a young child with a big head, any sort of hyperextending or underextending is going to get us in a disadvantaged position. So in a neonate particularly, getting your patient in the proper position is very, very important because it's going to help line up those, those axes that we're going to talk about a little bit later. You can make a very easy airway almost impossible with a little bit of hyper or underextension. This is an impossible airway to intubate right here in an otherwise normal baby. So head positioning, very, very important. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So normal babies, normal younger kids, when does the airway become more like an adult airway? I would say around puberty. But anywhere between five, six, and seven, it starts to get quite easy. So they have a large back of the head. They got a short neck. They got small nares, so that might affect the way we pre-oxygenate. A large tongue, big, big tonsils sometimes, a little bit difficult to pass a blade through there. Their epiglottis is big and floppy. It's also very um, cephalad, so closer to the head, um, and the other things that we've talked about. So when we intubate, there are several indications, but as I talked about earlier, your indications can be classified in four broad categories. Um, these are, this is based on a landmark paper in 2000 that went over intubation in general. And there's really four categories that we have to intubate or consider intubation for and four categories which are the same that we can extubate. And the first one is CNS. We need to be awake. We need to be able to coordinate the way we swallow. We need to be able to coordinate how we protect our airway. We need a brain that's working, CNS. 
So that means that if we have significant brain injury, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, traumatic brain injury, and our brain isn't connecting with our hypopharynx and our tongue, we're gonna run into troubles. So we need a brain that works. Along that line, when we're trying to extubate, the way we sometimes dysfunction the brain is with the meds that we give. So that when we extubate, we have to make certain that our kids are more or less awake underneath. So CNS is really, really important. As we get further down, we need um, to consider the airway. We need to intubate a patient if the airway is starting to close. So if they were exposed to a burn, for example, or caustic chemicals and they've got airway burn, that airway that has now been injured is only going to get smaller. So indications to intubate is if we have airway compromise. Conversely, in order to extubate, we have to ensure that that airway is open. And so we have to think about edema. So there's a, a landmark Cochrane review that looked at airway edema in neonatal patients. You have to really think about edema if it was a traumatic intubation, if they were intubated for more than one week, um, if they were very, very sick, um, and less than one month of age. Those are very, very high risk factors for edema. But even in our population, we see post-extubation strider quite frequently. So edema is a problem. The third one, which is the most obvious, is pulmonary. If we have bad lungs and we can't ventilate, then we need to intubate. Um, we need to intubate in most instances because of ventilation problems, not because of oxygenation problems. Okay? And again, when can we extubate? Well, when our lungs are healthy. That's easy. And the fourth one is we need to intubate if, in particular, we have significant LV failure. So left ventricular failure. And again, when we extubate, we have to ask our questions, is that left side of the heart working? Okay. Why is that? Because when we intubate and we ventilate with positive pressure, we help support the left ventricle. Okay. So then if you look at here, this nice circulation um, paper, inadequate central nervous system, category number one anatomical or functional airway obstruction. That's, airway, that's number two. Excessive work of breathing leading to fatigue. That's pulmonary. Um, high peak pressures. That's pulmonary. Hemodynamic compromise. That's LV failure. Lack of airway protective reflexes. That's number one, CNS. And permitting paralysis and sedation for diagnostic studies. That's also CNS and airway combined. Okay? So when you think about intubating, and then when we're on rounds, and uh, somebody says, well, let's extubate, run around those or, or those four um, categories to make certain that the patient is prepared. So, when we intubate in the field or in the hospital, RSI is always a risk. You don't know if you can get the airway. You don't know if you're going to bag. You hope you have done your whole assessment so that if you can't get the airway, you can bag. But um, some patients have really, really difficult airways that you might not be able to get. So you always have to balance the pros and the cons. We can bag patients very, very effectively. And in most instances, if you are not certain, bagging a patient is the safest option. However, a bagger, it doesn't have a perfect seal, although somebody on the bagger um, um, is, is probably better than the ventilator. You can imagine all the transitions that you have to do on the plane and off the plane in the ambulance. There's always risks for that. Never underestimate the power of being able to bag. That is so, so important. As well as when we're considering putting an airway in a child, we have to also think about what are we doing. If we're doing CPR, for example, maybe it's not a great idea to, um, to intubate, and maybe it's better just to ventilate for a while because it's going to interrupt chest compressions. Again, it's a balance. I'm not saying one is right or one is wrong. The most important thing is, is that if you anticipate difficulties of getting that airway, you have to kind of balance. Am I going to get further ahead struggling with an intubation of a very difficult airway, or maybe I can just maintain this patient bagging? So two bad scenarios. Um, this is from my mentor. It's the already screwed scenario where I can't ventilate despite maximal efforts to get an airway. That's a really, really difficult one. This is the one that we sometimes find ourselves in. It's bad and it's getting worse. We can ventilate right now, but very, very soon I won't be able to.
So we're going to try to avoid the I'm already screwed scenario because that's a bad one. The it's getting worse scenario is a bad scenario, um, but oftentimes we can get out of that one. The whole purpose of this talk and the subsequent one is to avoid the I'm already screwed scenario because that is one that's going to lead to really, really bad outcomes. Um, my subsequent talks are all going to be based on kind of this nice little color scheme here as far as what are the four, five, eight P's. There's, there's a lot of P's when we're talking about RSI and if you come up with another P you can probably write another paper because every time that a new P comes up there's a new paper. So right now what I want to focus on is predictors of, of a difficult intubation and predictors of being um, a, a very difficult patient to bag. But before we even think about intubation, and, and if you've ever been um, with me at my, my intubations and my timeouts, one of the most important things I always ask is, are we able to bag this patient? We do a very quick airway assessment. We'll talk about that. It's always important to have a plan B if plan A doesn't work. Prayer shouldn't be part of plan B, and you should have a plan C and a D, and we will have that because we'll talk about that. So the most, two most important questions that you should consider at all times are, will you be able to place the tube? And if there is any doubt, can you bag the patient if they're paralyzed? So those are the two most important things. Will you be able to place the tube, and can you ventilate them with a bag if you can't? Okay? Everything that we've talked about, everything about airway boils down to these two questions. And the really, really difficult compromising stories that you might have heard in the news or the bad stories that end up going into court, most of them are related to a problem of assessing these two very, very important questions. So when we talk about the difficult airway, this is again going to um, claims in the, in, in the U.S. with anesthetists who are taken to court. Very, very interesting is it was when there was a high level of mortality or morbidity, 75% of these cases were preventable, 75% of them were substandard care. And the unfortunate thing when we're dealing with an airway is this is not something to muck around with because 85% of them resulted in brain death or in death or brain damage or death. So the reality is, is that most of these difficult scenarios can be prevented. And the reason why we need to prevent them is because we don't have a lot of wiggle room, okay? This isn't the histology of the left ovary. This is where the rubber hits the road. This is important stuff. We need to avoid these as much as possible. There are going to be cases where we can't get around, but the majority of them we can predict beforehand. So the difficult airway, um, it's really difficult to come up with a definition that suits a difficult airway because some airways are really not that difficult. Like I mentioned with that neonatal patient, I can make a completely normal airway become almost impossible for you to intubate. But when you look at the literature, most of the time a difficult airway is one where the intubator experiences a difficulty with being able to mask ventilate or difficulty with tracheal intubation or both. It's a little bit of a loose term because it's really oftentimes in the hands of the manager of the airway um, and so it's not clear cut. <clears throat> the most important thing again looking at these questions is will you be able to place the tube, will you be able to ventilate? So how do you start? A very very quick history, an ample history and we'll talk about this a little bit later. It gives you an idea about what kind of patient that you're dealing with. And if this patient has a very, very prolonged past medical history, for example, and, uh, and, uh, and the medical history is compatible with eight ORs and all of them incredibly difficult intubations, and the anesthetist couldn't do it, and they had to bring EMT, and they had to intubate with a scope, that's a patient that you're not going to intubate. The events leading up to the intubation, where suppose you have a patient that has um, myocarditis and significant LV failure, this isn't a patient that you're going to jump into and, and ram an airway right, you know, right away. That's going to be one that you're going to be very cautious with. Or if they're allergic to succinylcholine, for example, or who knows, your history, very, very quick history directed towards um, the airway. Chronic snoring, um, again, more for your heavier kids. But a lot of kids have large tonsils and adenoids, very, very important because of right ventricular stress. Difficulties feeding. Well, why are they difficult feeding? Well, maybe they have some sort of esophageal, tracheal interaction, uh, abnormal hypopharynx. Maybe they have cardiac failure. 
recurrent croup is another indicator that that airway is intrinsically small and anytime they get a viral infection they start crouping so there's something wrong with that airway. Very, very important is have they ever been intubated and were there problems with the intubation. Okay, our examination will go into a little bit more detail. Um, an obese patient obviously has big, big challenges and a strider is no brainer. So what are our difficulties? Again, this is from the STARS manual, more directed towards older patients. Um, beards is not going to be a problem for most of ours. Um, but it's a nice little acronym that you can pick up because you're going to pick up teenagers that um, have tried to hang themselves or have got hit on the bike and they've got bigger beards than I could ever grow. So something to think about. Obesity, yeah, yeah, that's a big one. Obstruction, yeah, some of our patients do have a history of airway obstruction. Recurrent croup, for example, is a good one. Neck stiff, well, some of our congenital abnormalities have abnormal vertebrae in their neck. Um, trauma, no teeth is, is not a problem for us, and it's, it's, um, it's, it's less of a problem in pediatrics because they never had teeth in the first place. Expecting, probably not. Snore is very important. Stiff lungs, past medical history, do they have a history of cystic fibrosis, for example? So remember that acronym, it's very easy. I believe it's also in your manual that we put together for your, for your book. Now when you look at um, the difficulties of, of, of visualizing the airway, you'll hear about this LEMON acronym all the time in the adults. And the reality is, it's a very, very good thing to look at, but it never has been validated in kids. Some parts of this have been validated, but not all of it. We'll break all of these down, but look externally is, is the most obvious one. If they're Pierre Robin, for example, and they have no lower mandible, of course they're going to be difficult to intubate. We'll talk about the 332 rule, the Mal and Patty score, and, and the other ones in a little bit more detail. So the first one of Lemon is look. And as you know, in pediatrics, we have a lot of patients that have syndromes, abnormalities, sequences, and a lot of them manifest in a face that looks abnormal. Now, the problem with a face that looks abnormal is we're only looking very superficially. We can look at this kid, for example, here, and we can already see that they have mid-face hypoplasia. It doesn't have a, a maxilla or a mandible that's really formed. And so you can assume that you're going to have a little bit of difficulties getting to that airway. This is a difficult one. We have a patient here with a cleft palate and a cleft lip. Well, that cleft runs all the way down, and sometimes it's very difficult to landmark. So again, something that looks abnormal on the outside, you're going to have difficulties on the inside. So again, hypoplasia, micronathia, you have a tough enough time with your younger patients to turn that corner, never mind their jaw being small in the first place. Down syndromes with met, uh, relative macroglossia, you're going to have that blade and it's really, really difficult to get that tongue to the side. Um, clefts, hypoplasia here, you can imagine what the inside of the airway looks like. And so a number of other things here um, can lead to having a very, very difficult time getting that airway. So if there is obvious, you don't have to know that they have down slanting palpebral fissures with mid-face hypoplasia. Look at the kid. If they look normal, that's going to be in your benefit. If there's some abnormality, even if you can't put your finger to it, might affect the way that you're going to intubate. Okay? So why? So micronathia, less displacement. Okay, they don't have a very big lower part of their mouth. That tongue isn't going to rest there. It's going to protrude. It's going to come forward. Macroglossia, less space for your blade. Some patients can't um, open up their mouths very wide. Um, congenital trismus, I think it's called. If you can't open up your mouth, you're going to have a heck of a time getting your blade and then the airway in. Um, sometimes your larynx is going to be blocked. Sometimes you're not able to position the patient properly. So again, if your patient looks abnormal, assume that it's going to be a difficult airway. When we talk about the 332 rule in adults, um, really what that is a measurement is how protruding is the, the mandible and how far down is the airway. That's kind of the 332 rule. And kids, you can't have the 332 rule because the kids are obviously growing and, and if you want to come up with a 332 rule, you'd have to have different numbers for different ages. But basically the 332 rule addresses the fact, is the mouth big enough to hold the tongue and is the airway low enough so you can make that corner? Well, you can see in this patient here with mandibular hypoplasia, this is going to be a difficult airway. Number one, does the baby look normal? No, the baby doesn't look normal. And what is it? If you can't put your finger on it, 
Um, it doesn't matter. This is an airway that I wouldn't wrestle with. This child has mandibular hypoplasia. It's good, the tongue is going to be protruding out, and you're going to have a real tough time turning that corner. How about the mouth opening? Again, you have to be able to open up the mouth in order to insert your tools. Um, this isn't a common problem. I've only seen congenital trismus once patients that can't open up their mouths. In older kids, for example, you sometimes see them having dental appliances where they are restricted. Sometimes with um, mandibular surgery, for example, the mouth is wired shut. Of course, these are things that you would get beforehand, but there are instances where you're not going to be able to open up the mouth wide enough. Um, and again, the three, three, the final two is essentially a measurement from the hyoid boy to the thyroid. Again, do you have enough neck to turn that corner? And of course, there's a lot of conditions. This child's got turners here where there is no neck and the neck is, is webbed. You're going to have a tough time getting there. Okay? The Mal and Patty assessment, again, has not been validated in kids. And basically, when your anesthetist comes pre op, they ask you to open up your mouth and they look at your mouth. And essentially, what they want to see is they want to see back of the mouth with the uvula hanging down. Um, not all adults are like that, and as we get to diff more difficult gratings, you can see that all of a sudden my entrance to the hypopharynx, I cannot see. So it seems pretty obvious that if I can't see my hypopharynx when the mouth is open, I'm going to have a heck of a time when I sedate and paralyze the kid. Again, you're not going to be able to do this in most kids, but keep it in the back of your mind. Obstruction and obesity. Yes, we do sometimes have kids with BMIs of 45, 50, for which we would have to talk over the phone about what's the best way to position. Oftentimes with very, very obese patients, it's a very, very good idea um, to put the head of the bed up so that gravity can pull the adipose tissue down rather than bringing it up and, uh, and perhaps occluding a little bit of the airway. This kid here is going to be a tough airway. Um, if you don't know what's off with this, you just have to recognize that something is not normal here and that you might not be able to put an endotracheal tube in. Okay, so obstruction and obesity. Neck mobility, again, um, hasn't been validated in, in kids, but it's something to keep in the back of your mind. This is more for older adults, for example, who have osteoarthritic changes in their neck. And when you're going to intubate, you want to get into that sniffing position. And you can't possibly do that with some of the older patients because the bones won't let you. But in kids, it's not a bad idea to ask about neck mobility, particularly if they are abnormal looking children because a lot of them do have vertebral anomalies in their neck. And you want to get them in the right position and you just can't. So again, keep that in the back of your mind. So it's the lemon pneumotic. Um, with the mal and patty. So when we looked at um, kids, for example, um, they looked at adult data, they tried to figure out, so which of these is, is really the best one and if we score them, and really the bottom line is that there's no great predictive value in any of these, but even though there's not great predictive value in any of these, it forces you to go through the mnemonic to pick up the most obvious. And the obvious is obvious right now, but if you're in the heat of the moment, the obvious isn't obvious, and we see that over and over and over again. Okay, so then while we're at it again, um, these are common mnemonics. Um, I wouldn't expect you to memorize it. LMAs are going to be our rescue airway um, and difficult crikes as well. So this is just for your records. Um, so. With all of this, I said, well, this is what the adults do, but it's really not validated in peens. What is really, really important? And it's really interesting because there are two things that come up over and over again to predict a difficult airway. And one of them is a history of a difficult airway. So again, with your ample history before you're going to intubate the child, one of the most important questions you can ask is, has this child ever been intubated and were there problems with the intubation? And if you have a parent there, everybody will remember it. They will say, oh, yeah, 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 we went for a TNA, and there was 20 people that ran into the room, and it was a real big deal. Parents will remember a difficult airway, and any hospital will tell their parents, remember that your kid has a difficult airway. So a history of a difficult airway seems really, really obvious, but if you hear that, ding, 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 bell warning signs. The second one is sign of upper airway obstruction. Um, so again, is there strider? Is there biphasic strider? Um, and so these are the two things that seem to come out over and over and over again. So final considerations is um, RSI is not appropriate for all kids. Um, 
We'll try to do it as safe as we possibly can. We'll do our assessment. You'll be taught how to do it. Um, but RSI is not appropriate for all kids. Um, losing the airway in a difficult uh, airway patient will kill the patient or cause significant brain injury. So RSI, not appropriate in all cases. A tenuous airway, so an airway that's kind of E, that allows for a little bit of oxygenation and subpar ventilation might be a lot better than a patient who lost their airway completely. So there might be some transports where you're having a heck of a time oxygenating. And maybe we're going to accept SATs of 60%. Maybe we're going to accept sat, uh, CO2s of, of 80, 85. Maybe this is going to be a lot safer than trying to do something heroic and lose the airway altogether and kill the patient. Okay? So intubation on the full stomach. Um, do you guys want to have a break? How much more? We can finish it? Yeah. Okay. Intubation on the full stomach. So the whole purpose of RSI rapid sequence intubation is the whole idea that when we intubate patients um, that come through the emergency or critically ill, we have no idea how much food they have in their stomach. That's the whole purpose of RSI. In anesthesia, they have the wonderful world where they MPO for eight hours, they come in, they get a little gas, a little sleepy, a little bit more gas. Everything is very, very controlled. When we intubate patients, there is not a lot of control. The control is what we bring to that situation. One of the things that we can't um, correct is gastric contents. And that's the unfortunate reality. That's why in your ample or sample history, you ask when the last meal was, because if they just have eaten, and let's say they're kind of on the edge and you don't know where they're going, maybe it's not a bad idea to wait a little bit. Gastric contents we, or contents we need to account for, so how do we get around that? The problem with gastric contents is obviously when we paralyze and sedate the patient, we lose tone in our esophageal sphincter, and there's a very high probability that some of the food is going to move up. And aspiration can be a problem, and you don't need a lot in order to, to basically create this picture of ARDS. Okay? So pulmonary aspirations are not our friends, and if we have a full stomach, our risk of aspirating might be a little bit higher. So how are there good aspirations or bad aspirations? Well, if a patient just ate, for example, and they got big chunks of who knows what in their stomach, and that comes up in the airway, that can be a problem. Smaller um, size um, particles are obviously going to be tolerated a little bit easier. Things like bacterial counts you can't, or content you really can't uh, modulate. And the patient's underlying cardiopulmonary status is very important because if they're already on the edge and they had this big aspiration, you might be pushing them over. If they're relatively healthy, then they're going to be tolerating an episode of aspiration perhaps a little bit better. So what will happen if we aspirate or if a patient aspirates? So food comes up the stomach, it goes into the hypopharynx, it goes through the cords, and it goes down the trachea. Well, it can cause bronchospasm, that kind of sucks, but uh, we can deal with that a little bit with some of the meds that we can modulate. We can cause an acute pneumonitis, so this is a chemical irritation, and that is something that we cannot deal with very well. We don't have any medications to clean that up. And because you have an acute pneumonitis, you can develop right heart failure very, very quickly. And if it's bilateral, we can get into a picture of florid ARDS. So sequelae of aspiration can be quite significant. So what, how, how common is it? And in pediatrics, um, is it a real big deal? So there was a nice little paper in 98, and um, he basically um, looked at intraoperative um, aspiration, and um, he kind of looked at all the numbers, and we're looking at clinical history, and it doesn't happen that often. It happens one in a thousand. But even in that one in a thousand, no deaths had occurred from this. But remember, this is intraoperatively. These are patients that have been NPO, patients that are more or less stable. Happens one in a thousand with no significant sequelae. From his observation, again, these are controlled patients in the OR. Larger kids were at a greater risk. Um, higher ASA status, meaning that they were sick. And ASA is a criteria that, that measures how sick you are going into the OR. So sick, big patients. What does that stand for? ASA is um, American...